All right, everybody. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Um, we are so excited to have Teresa L. Goodrich back with us. You may remember all the way back, think back to 2019, a <laughs> hundred years ago. Um, and um, when we last had Teresa in the library with us and she um, was introducing and reading excerpts from her Tulane Gems book series, volumes one and two, she was sharing volume two with us that night. Um, that was a great time. We had such a great response from everybody at the library. And there may be some of you out there in the audience tonight. So thank you because you made it possible for us to bring Teresa back. Um, and you may also know Teresa um, as the founder of The Local Tourist, um, an amazing website and resource for um, Chicago tourism, but also expanded out into um, other parts of the United States. And um, so just a few things tonight before we get started, and I hand it over to Teresa. Um, if you have any questions for her, please make sure to put them in the Q&A box. Um, you'll see that at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you put them in the chat, that um, works as well, but she might not see them and we might, we might skip over it. I'll be keeping an eye on that. My colleague Pat will be keeping an eye, but try and put them in the Q&A box because then Teresa can definitely see them and makes it easier for her and for us. Um, and we are recording this program tonight. So if, um, if you would like to watch it again later, share it with a friend, we will be getting it up on our YouTube and I will be emailing out the link to everybody who signed up. Um, and without further ado, I think that's all the, the business. Um, I will hand it over to Teresa. So thank you again. And uh, here is Teresa. She's gonna be sharing um, from her upcoming book, Living Landmarks of uh, Chicago and reading some excerpts tonight. So we're gonna be kind of the first to hear some of these amazing passages. And uh, without further ado, I will hand it on over. So here's Teresa. Hello everybody and thank you, Katie. And it's really good to be back. Uh, with the Crystal Lake Public Library. Thank you so much for having me. I figured I'd start with just a little little bit about me. Uh, Katie gave me a quick introduction. Uh, so I started the local tourist back in 2002 and it started as just a guide to the River North neighborhood of Chicago, expanded to cover downtown Chicago, and then in 2008 uh, expanded to cover the entire city and suburbs. Uh, but my dream had always been to travel the country and tell its stories. And in 2016, I began doing that. And then <clears throat> the next year, my husband and I took a 31-day road trip from Elgin to San Diego and back. And I wrote my first book. And that was the Tulane Gems, Volume 1, Turkeys Are Jerks and Other Observations of an American Road Trip. Uh, the next year, we took a 35-day road trip, this time to the Oregon coast and back. And that became Volume two, Tulane Gems, Volume 2 bison or giant and other observations from an American road trip. Um, I have uh, also spoken at a few different places. I'm a, I've spoken at the Travel and Adventure Show in San Diego the previous two years and I will be doing a virtual presentation with them on December 9th for their America West and East presentation. Um, so it's a virtual travel show when we can travel again. And I'll be talking about road trips and uh, sharing 50 tips and tricks on how to plan your perfect road trip. Um, I've been a mentor at Blog House in 2019 in Scottsdale, Arizona. That's an intimate conference for bloggers who want to turn their hobby into a business or want to take their business up to the next level. Um, I have also led the Midwest Travel Network um, Network's writing workshop. Our first one was October of last year in Hendricks County. It was, the second one was supposed to be this year in uh, Gulf Shores, Alabama, but both COVID and the hurricanes kind of took care of that. So we're, we pushed it back to next spring, but uh, I do lead a writing workshop and it's, it's geared towards travel writers to help them figure out how to bring a destination to life. Um, this summer or this year as well, at the end of this month, I contributed the Illinois section and a portion of South Dakota for Midwest Road Trip Adventures. It's an anthology with uh, several other Midwest writers and we cover every road trips in all 12 states of the Midwest. Um, and also this year also with 
uh, everybody staying at home, I had some time uh, to take all of my Chicago content from the local tourist and, and just rebrand it as your Chicago guide. So that is now completely dedicated to the Chicago uh, things to do and landmarks and, and um, there's a whole events calendar. Uh, and so then all the travel content is on the local tourist. So that is a little bit about me. Uh, go into, uh, let me tell you about this new book, uh, Living Landmarks of Chicago. It will be out in December. And it came about because in 2019, I decided we, I wasn't going to take another month long trip. And so my husband knew that I was feeling a little, you know, I had the author bug. I wanted to, I wanted to write another book and we were out hiking in one of the conservation areas. McHenry County Conservation District has almost 30 conservation areas and I hiked every single one of them in August of 2019. And, and we were at Silver Creek, which is where this picture is from. And my husband said, well, why don't you take all the guides you've written to the different landmarks and just put them together and turn that into a book? And I thought, well, that's a great idea. But of course, it's not that simple. I ended up, I thought, I want to know the stories behind all these landmarks. I want to dig in, find out who the people were that made these landmarks stand out, like the Palmer House and Auditorium Theater. And I'm going to be reading the, the chapters about those two uh, landmarks tonight, uh, but also like Grant Park and uh, the Blackstone Hotel. And all these landmarks that you see, and you know there's so much history, but it, I, want, I wanted to go beyond the architecture. Because even though the buildings themselves are beautiful and innovative in so many ways for their time uh, and still stand the test of time, what's, what happened inside them? What happened to create them? So that's where how Living Landmarks uh, came about. The, um, the book will also have, and that's in process now, that it's going to ha has a companion website that will not only have um, all of the landmarks that are featured in the book with summaries and contact information so you can find out more and maps, but we're also doing um, audio tours, audio self-guided walking tours, and I'm going to have all of the resources that I um, used to do the research for this book listed on the site. If they're public domain, I'll also be including the text. So that, that companion website is going to be a great resource if you love digging into history. And at the end of this presentation, I'm also going to be sharing some of the resources that I used, have been using uh, to, to find out all these uh, fun and cool stories about Chicago's past. So, Without further ado, the, how I'm going to structure this, uh, the, the chapters, because I, it's hard to just a couple of paragraphs from each chapter. So I've chosen um, a few, uh, three landmarks. I'm going to read the entire chapter so you'll get the whole story of these landmarks. But I'm also going to uh, read the introduction to the book so you get a better feel of what it's about. And then also the uh, Chicago's origin story, because that in itself is fascinating how this, the third largest city in the U.S. Um, came to be. All right, well, let me get a drink of water. <laughs> get started. Okay. So, what is Living Landmarks? And by the way, the cover, my husband designed the cover, and I just think it's absolutely gorgeous. There's reason behind every element, and I'm I'm very proud of it and grateful that he took the time to bring my, this vision I had to life and then add his own vision that made it even better. So anyway, oh, the, um, what is Living Landmarks? History lines Chicago sidewalks. Stroll down LaSalle or Dearborn or State and you'll see skyscrapers that have been there for a century or more. It's easy to scurry by, to dismiss the building itself, but a hunt for placards turns up landmarks every few feet, it seems. Here's a Chicago landmark. There's a National Historic Landmark. They're everywhere. Ironically, these skyscrapers keep the city grounded, illustrating a past where visionaries took fanciful, impossible ideas and made them reality. Buildings sinking, raise them. River polluting the lake and its precious drinking water, re reverse it. Overpopulation and urban scrawl making it challenging to get to work, build up. 
From the bare to the ornate, from exposed beams to ornamented facades, the city's architecture is unabashedly various, yet provides a cohesive, beautiful skyline that illustrates the creativity of necessity and the necessity of creativity. Chicago is the physical manifestation of dreamers, malcontents, philanthropists, and grifters. In 1985, Pat Collender said in the New York Times, it's a city of contradictions, of private visions haphazardly overlaid and linked together. And it is. Some people love it. Some hate it. Sometimes it's the same people and sometimes in the same day. I'm one of the lovers who believes the city is vibrant and willful and beautiful. And while other urban areas have fostered their own breed of characters, Chicago seems so very Chicago. Each chapter is a vignette, a story, if you will, that introduces you to the landmark and brings it to life. For the most part, I've organized living landmarks chronologically. After a soundbite history of the city's origins, you'll meet the oldest house in Chicago. Or is it? Kinda, sorta, depends on who you ask. That's Chicago. Nothing simple and nothing can be taken for granted. The reason we have a gorgeous skyline and a vibrant culture and a notorious reputation for graft is because of those who built it, envisioned it, manipulated it. That skyline is also the result of a renewed determination after a devastating loss. Few of the landmarks are dated before 1871. That's because the Great Chicago Fire obliterated what had been downtown. The conflagration began October 8, 1871, consumed more than three square miles and killed 300 people. More than 100,000 were suddenly homeless. The destruction was a defining moment, if not the defining moment in the history of Chicago and its impact seared into the city's consciousness is referenced several times throughout this book. This book isn't about buildings per se. It's about rich, complex, convoluted passions that shaped a metropolis. Living Landmark is a bit of humor, a touch of sass, and a whole lot of passion for this great American city. Let's meet Chicago, shall we? Hey, now I'm going to use Chicago, the origin story. It's hard to imagine Chicago as less than a destination. She's the kind of city that walks into a room and everybody stops whatever they're doing. She's talented, riotous, at times beautifully serene, and at others, ear-splittingly chaotic. But up until the mid-1800s, she was more often than not a portage to somewhere else. Since time immemorial, the spot at the southwest corner of a giant inland lake has been a transportation hub. The Miami and Illinois, and then the Potawatomi, could get from one place to another through the network of rivers and streams they call Chicago. There's a continental divide running through the area, and a short strip of land separates rivers flowing east to Lake Michigan and west to the Mississippi River. The French explored this stinky, swampy land in the 1600s. Marquette and Joliet, followed later by La Salle, forded and poured, portaged and mapped. Joliet suggested that cutting a canal could connect Lake Erie to the Gulf of Mexico, a prescient glimpse of Chicago's future. Gradually, a few European men traded and occasionally married into the local tribes. Those unions may have been about love, but they were also good business. Once you were a member of the family, you had the keys to the kingdom or at least some guidance and a relative safety net. None of the explorers stayed for any length of time. A few seasonal trading posts popped up over the years, but relations between the original inhabitants and the newcomers had sometimes violent outcomes. By the late 1780s, however, the revolution spawned a new country and this land became one of its territories. In 1795, the Treaty of Greenville gave the Americans one piece of land, six miles square, at the, uh, the mouth of Chicago River, emptying into the southwest end of Lake Michigan. And it wasn't too much longer before the original inhabitants were kicked out completely. As you can imagine, that didn't go well. Chicago's first non-native permanent settler, like his predecessors, was French. Unlike his predecessors, he was Black. Jean-Baptiste Pointe de Sable and Kitty Hawa, his Pot Potawatomi wife, settled on a plot of land on the north side of the Chicago River. When they arrived isn't exactly known, but according to a journal entry that Hugh Heward made in 1790, the couple was already well established. The de Sables sold their property in 1800 to Jean-Baptiste Lalime for the impressive sum of $1,200. 
They could get such a princely amount because, by that time, the property consisted of a home filled with furnishings, as well as a barn and several outbuildings. For a remote trading post in a place that smelled like garlic, this was quite the setup. In 1803, the government saw the importance of establishing a presence in Chicago and began building Fort Dearborn. The next year, they completed construction, and with the perceived safety of a military outpost, more settlers arrived. It was more of a trickle than a flood, but their numbers made the Potawatomi none too happy. The locals had already given up so much of their home, and while the French had been transient, these new Americans had no intention of leaving and claimed the land as their own. At the same time, tensions between Britain and its former colonies escalated until it became a full-on war in 1812. After General William Hull learned that Fort Mackinac had fallen to the Brits, the evacuation of Fort Dearborn. The order arrived on August 9th, and on August 15th, Captain Heald led a garrison of 54 regulars, 12 militia, 9 women, and 18 children. The small group got about a mile and a half south when around 500 Potawatomis attacked. The tribe took the few survivors prisoner and burned the fort. In 1816, the U.S. Army rebuilt Fort Dearborn, and the Treaty of St. Louis gave the U.S. the land they needed to create the canal Joliet had conceived of a century and a half prior. There was no mad rush to take up residence, though, and in 1820, there were only about 60 people. Garrisons ping-ponged in and out. In May of 1823, the garrison was ordered to evacuate and left by the fall of that year. On October 3rd, 1828, Fort Dearborn once again housed a garrison of about 60. Two and a half years later, that garrison left for Green Bay, but they were back at the fort on June 17, 1832. Then on July 10th, the Sheldon Thompson, a boat bringing soldiers for the Black Hawk War, also brought cholera. Within a week, there were 58 fatalities. Chicago couldn't catch a break. Except, while well, all of this do we stay or do we go was happening, Illinois entered the Union in 1818, the wildly successful Erie Canal opened in 1825, and in 1826, the U.S. Congress gave Illinois the acreage it needed for its very own canal. Three years later, the Illinois leg legislature appointed a canal commission to make this water highway a reality. And in 1830, James Thompson drew up the first street grid of Chicago. Prospectors and daring pioneers bought lots, and lo and behold, on August 12, 1833, the stinky, swampy land officially became a town. I'm going to see if there are any, no, no questions. I'm gonna take a drink real quickly. I hope, hope you're enjoying it so far. If you have any questions or comments, uh, do let me know. Obviously, if there's a lot of dates and information in here. No. <clears throat> okay. And the book opens with the Clark House. So, picture this. It's 1835. Your family is comfortable. You live in upstate New York, members of the upper middle class. You've been married for a few years, have a few children, although one sadly died, and your husband trots off to a marshy prairie on the shores of a giant inland lake. He comes back filled with dreams and visions. Carolyn, I found our new home. It'll take three weeks to get there, and it's pretty much a backwater now, but it'll grow. Oh, yes, it'll grow. Shall we? And you look at your husband, and instead of saying, are you off your rocker? You say, sure, honey, why not? In the early 1830s, Henry Brown Clark was a merchant in Utica, New York. His father was an attorney and judge, and his grandfather was a Revolutionary War hero. Carolyn Palmer Clark was that oh-so-rare early 19th century phenomenon, an educated woman. She attended the first higher education institution for women in the United States. The Troy Female Seminary, founded by and later named for Emma Willard, opened in 1821 with the express purpose of providing women the same educational opportunities as men. What a radical concept. Henry and Carolyn married in 1827, and eight years later, Henry's brother-in-law, Charles Walker, returned from a trip to Chicago with tales of potential riches. The two-year-old town's prime location on Lake Michigan along the Chicago River meant it was ripe for expansion. Rumors of the upcoming Illinois and Michigan Canal, which would enable boat passage to the Mississippi River, drove hundreds and then thousands 
to place their bets on this new frontier. Many Easterners had made their fortunes when the Erie Canal opened and the INM presented a similar opportunity. By the time the Clarks made their westward journey, they didn't even have to worry about moving on to Native American land. The Second Treaty of Chicago in 1833 sent the tribe west, and their last dance on their native soil took place in 1835. Sidebar, there will be sidebars. Uh, there are sidebars um, in various chapters in the book when there's some information that is important but doesn't quite fit in the narrative, and this is, this is one of them. So direct descendants of the removed tribes began returning to the Chicago area after World War I. Today, Chicago has the third largest urban Native American population in the country, representing over 100 tribal nations. Once Henry arrived, his merchant background came in handy, and he quickly became a partner of Jones, King & Company, a wholesale hardware firm. Instead of settling close to the action, Mr. and Mrs. Clark purchased 20 acres about a mile and a half south of the nearest neighbor. To get to town, they rode a dirt trail that had been worn by the Potawatomi. Their grand landscape, which stretched from Lake Michigan to what is now State Street, and from present-day 16th Street to 17th Street, transitioned from dunes to marshy prairies. The family moved into an existing log cabin, which probably belonged to Elijah Harmon, their property's previous owner. Buying that much land that far away from relative civilization might have seemed foolhardy, but it ended up being far-sighted and the reason their house survived. That, and because Carolyn wanted a home made of timber. When the Clarks moved to Chicago, Carolyn wanted a strong house. She didn't want any of that newfangled balloon construction, so-called because the buildings went up quickly. Nope, she wanted a sturdy home built of thick hewn wood. It didn't matter that they'd live in a log cabin with their kids for a year, or that they'd need expensive skilled labor, or that the material would be more costly than boards connected with machine-made nails. She did not pick up and move across the country to live in some flimsy, insubstantial shack. Carolyn wanted to. Carolyn got timber. The Clarks moved into their Greek Revival home with its portico and Doric columns in 1836. Although they hadn't finished the interior, they'd get to it. After all, Henry was a mover and shaker. In addition to the hardware store, he'd become a director of Chicago's first bank, volunteered for fire engine number one, and participated in the canal committee. And then the bottom fell out. The panic of 1837, two months after the town of Chicago was incorporated as a city, meant failed banks, including Henry's. The wholesale hardware firm stumbled. Canal talk stopped. The panic devastated the Clarks financially, and in 1838, all construction. They barely hung onto the home and property itself, and only escaped foreclosure through the largesse of Charles Walker, the brother-in-law who'd enticed them to move in the first place. Was it time to quit? Turn around and head back to New York? No way. Henry began dairy farming. He milked cows and farmed and hunted on their vast property. The unfinished South Parlor turned into a meat locker. They took in boarders. Alice Bernard, who became Chicago Public Schools' first female principal, rented a room above the hanging deer, snipe, plover, quail, chickens, and duck. The smell, to put it mildly, was less than desirable. The economy began to improve, and Henry obtained a position as a city clerk. They had more children. The city continued to grow. By 1840, 4,000 people lived in Chicago. In 1847, Cyrus McCormick brought his harvester manufacturing to the city. The next year, both the I&M Canal and the Galena to Chicago Railroad began operations, enticing more and more and more fortune seekers. All of those bodies meant lots of <clears throat> waste, which meant disease. In 1849, a cholera epidemic killed nearly 3% of a population that had been quickly climbing to 30,000, including Henry B. Clark. Carolyn, now known as the Widow Clark, had six children to care for on her own, so she did what any sensible widow in possession of 20 acres in a city with an exploding population would do. She carved her acreage up into lots and sold them for a hefty sum. With her newfound financial security, she redesigned her home in the manner with which she wanted to become accustomed. She added gas service and modern lighting. A second portico enhanced the building's symmetry. A cupola provided a view of Lake Michigan and access to its refreshing breezes. The dreadful odoriferous meat locker became an ornate double parlor with Italian fireplaces and colorful medallions on the ceiling. As was the custom, the widow Clark entertained calling guests for 15 minutes apiece 
while her daughters played brilliantly on the chickering piano. Only uplifting conversation was allowed during these visits, with no hint of politics, scandal, or impropriety. It was all well and good and proper, and lasted until Carolyn died in 1860. The home stayed in the family for the next several years. Because Henry and Carolyn had chosen to build so far south, the Great Chicago Fire of 1871 missed the house entirely. The next year, the children sold the home to a successful tailor and his wife, John and Lydia Crimes. Even though their new property had escaped the previous year's fire unscathed, the proximity and density of the city's population concerned the crimes. They were also fretful of the air pollution because of their ailing son, so they picked up the house and moved it 28 blocks south and one block west. The house stayed in the crimes family for three generations. John and Lydia's granddaughters, Lydia and Laura, knew the, signific knew the significance of the building, but they, by 1941, they didn't want to live in it, in it anymore. They searched until they could find someone who would appreciate the historical value and preserve the structure for future generations. Ideally, they wanted the city to buy it and turn it into a museum. The city said no, but Lewis Henry Ford said yes. At the time, Ford was a 27-year-old bishop of the St. Paul Church of God in Christ on the south side of Chicago. He and his congregation built a church next to the house, which they used for offices, a school, events, for the parsonage. The church didn't just use the house, they also preserved it. According to an article dated August 19, 1962, in the Chicago Daily Tribune, the congregation had spent $18,000 restoring and preserving the historic structure. In 1970, the Commission on Chicago Landmarks officially designated the Clark House a landmark, and in 19 77, the city purchased the home to, to turn it into a museum. But first, the house needed to be moved back to its almost original location. It had been more than a century since the first move, and this one provided a new challenge. The L tracks were in the way. On a cold December night, we stopped the trains and hydraulic lifts raised the Clark House over the tracks and stayed there. It was so cold that the lifts froze. For two weeks, train riders would get a glimpse of Chicago's oldest house as they went on their merry way. The lifts finally thawed and the house landed in its present location. Since then, it's been faithfully restored to the configuration the widow Clark had designed. While none of the displayed furnishings ever belonged to the Clarks, they are representative of the period, thanks to the National Society of the Colonial Dames of America in the state of Illinois. Today, the Clark House Museum is a rare look into the time before the Great Chicago Fire cleared the landscape of nearly everything that had been built before 1871. It's also a lesson in fortitude and the grit required to pick up and move to a, a marshy prairie on the shores of a giant inland lake. Okay, I'm going to get a quick drink of water. No, oh, I love that story because this house built in 1836 was moved not once, but twice. I just, I think that's fantastic. I know we've got three in the chat. Okay. Well. And this is what the Clark House looks like today. So they have brought it back. You can see the cupola that, that the widow Clark had added. This is actually in the women and children garden, um, the, the grass around it, the women and children garden or park that is um, in the South Loop. Oh. And it's also right next to the Glessner House Museum, which is another landmark that's, that's featured in the book. Okay, got a question. Oh, thank you so much, Vera. Appreciate it. So she said, fascinating and eloquently presented. Fantastic. Well, our next landmark is one of my favorites. It's actually a lot of people's favorites. And there's a story about this. It's a very romantic story, but um, we're going to bust a myth about this landmark. And that's the Palmer House. Okay. Palmer House. 1873, when this one was built. The Palmer House is opulence defined. Its chandeliers and sculptures weigh a ton, literally. Entering the lobby through the travertine double staircase is like being smacked on one cheek with history and on the other with affluence. To state the obvious, it's gorgeous, 
and it is the most historic and luxurious hotel lobby in Chicago. It started with a love story, although it's not as dramatic as one enduring myth would have you believe. There's a consistent narrative about Palmer House's beginnings that usually starts like this. Potter Palmer built his hotel as a wedding gift. The hotel opened on September 26, 1871, but burned down just 13 days later in the Great Chicago Fire. While that is romantic and tragic, that's not quite what happened. Even though the story is repeated over and over and has reached mythic proportions, like the tale that Mrs. O'Leary's much maligned cow started the Great Chicago Fire, it's not accurate. But parts of it are true, and it is still a love story of both a December-May couple and the city they adored. Potter Palmer, born on May 20th, 1826, in Albany County, New York, migrated west in 1852. Although his family owned a thriving farm, he preferred the retail life and had already run his own store before he left to New York. With $5,000 in seed money from his father, he moved to the booming town of Chicago and very quickly made his mark. In about five years, his dry goods mercantile on Lake Street grew from a small market to an emporium spread out over four stories. While P. Palmer and Company was not the only dry goods merchant in Chicago, his concept was unique because his was the first store to offer exchanges, returns, and bargain sales. He also had the inspired idea that attractive window displays would entice customers. Bertha Onore, born on May 22, 1849, in Louisville, Kentucky, moved to Chicago in 1855 with her parents, naturally, since she was all of six years old. The wealthy Onores gave their precocious child every advantage, and that included outings at P. Palmer and Company. Potter's fortunes ascended, and he and Bertha's parents ran in the same circles. By the time Bertha was a teenager, he'd become a frequent guest at the Onori's home. At the ripe young age of 13, Bertha must have been fairly formidable because Potter Palmer was smitten, despite being 23 years her senior. Fortunately, he didn't ask her dad for his daughter's hand or act the Lothario. Over the next six years, Potter made millions in real estate and cotton speculation, sold his store to young protege Marshall Field, and took off for Europe at the advice of his doctors. Bertha grew up. She attended St. Xavier's Academy in Chicago and, after the Civil War, the Convent of the Visitation in Georgetown, where she received highest honors. She excelled in botany, logic, philosophy, astronomy, literature, algebra, and chemistry. She also played the harp. Bertha carried herself with elegance, had a waist the width of a thimble, and by all accounts would have been a catch for any man. Any man with a backbone, that is. Bertha was no wilting flower. Potter returned from his sojourn in 1868, the year after he came back from her studies. Potter brought, bought blocks of real estate on State Street. By the time he proposed and she said yes, he'd succeeded in moving the shopping district from Lake Street to that great street. In 1870, Bertha was 21 years old and her fiance, more than double her age, was 44. He'd made $40 million by the time he was 40 and the social scene was all a titter. The age difference combined with Potter's enormous wealth was fodder for the rumor mill. When the couple married on July 29, 1870, it was scandalous enough that the Chicago Tribune came to their defense. The engagement has been short, only two months. It is stated that the bridegroom, when going away recently, offered to settle a million dollars on his intended bride, but she nobly and persistently refused. This may put an end to the bitter observations of envious or cynical persons inclined to stamp the marriage contract so momentous to the high contracting parties as a commercial transaction. No matter who married Mr. Palmer, the same cruel and unjust remarks would be made. While Mr. Palmer could, convince, could not convince his new bride to take a million dollars, he could give her a hotel. Palmer House, Potter's wedding gift to Bertha, opened on September 26, 1870. September 26, 1870, not 1871. The day after the hotel's inspection, the Chicago Tribune reported, not less than 5,000 of our citizens accompanied by their wives and daughters attended the Palmer House's opening at State and Quincy. The first Palmer House existed in all its glory for a year and 13 days before its untimely demise. The confusion regarding the wedding gift timing may have occurred because in 1871, another Palmer House was underway. The foundation for Palmer House II had been laid at State and Monroe. 
A boat loaded with iron destined for the new hotel was moored at the docks when the fire tore through the city. Potter was out of town on business and his wedding gift burned. His quick-thinking architect, John Van Ock, took the plans for the new hotel, raced into the basement, and buried them in clay. This not only saved the plans, but it also provided inspiration for future fireproofing. Potter quickly returned to Chicago and nearly left just as fast, but Bertha told him no way were they going to run. Mr. Palmer, she said, it is the duty of every Chicagoan to stay here and devote his fortune and energies to rebuilding this stricken city, according to a 1902 article in the New York Times. The Palmer State. Potter secured a loan for $1.7 million, the largest private individual bank loan in the United States at the time. He never rebuilt his hotel at State, at State in Quincy, but his Monroe Street Palace welcomed first guest within two years. It was an opulent affair, worthy of a woman who could have gone anywhere in the world but chose to stay. There were electric lights, telephones, and elevators. The lobby resembled a grandly scaled European drawing room, and the barbershop floor was inlaid with silver dollars. The dining room served blue points on the shell, green turtle soup, quail on toast, and smoked beef tongue. Baths could be had if one applied at the office. Bertha's sister, Ida, married U President Ulysses S. Grant's son, and it was only natural that the general would be a guest when visiting Chicago. In 1879, the Palmer House hosted a banquet in Grant's honor after his round-the-world trip. By the end of Mark Twain's 2 a.m. toast, the president might have felt like he'd toured the world again. In 1874 and 1875, the Palmers had two sons, Honore and Potter Jr., respectively. Potter continued his entrepreneurial success and helped beautify, oops, sorry, helped beautify the city with his involvement with the South Park Commission. He donated regularly and prolifically. Bertha bought scores of from contemporary artists like Monet and Degas. She invited factory girls into her home to learn about their working conditions and do something to improve them. She helped millinery workers and shop girls. And when Jane Addams opened Hull House in 1889, Bertha helped her get what she needed. As president of the Board of Lady Managers for the World's Columbian Exposition of 1893, Bertha insisted that a female architect design the women's building. And what Bertha wanted, Bertha got. You seen a theme here? <laughs> She also instructed her kitchen to create a dessert that people could carry, and the Palmer House chefs invented the brownie. The woman was a force, and any questions about the age difference between her and Potter must have disappeared quickly. Potter passed away in 1902, and over the next 16 years, Bertha ran the business, traveled to Europe, bought much of Sarasota, Florida, and doubled the estate her husband had left her. After her death in 1918, Honora and Potter Jr. realized that Chicago, that Chicago could sustain a much larger hotel. The sons hired Hollibird and Roche to design this final iteration of their father's dream. The two inherited their parents' and entrepreneurial savvy. Instead of shutting down the hotel during construction, they built one half at a time, ensuring continual operation. When the Palmer House was completed in 1925, it was said to be the largest hotel in the world a distinction it would retain for a short two years. In keeping with previous standards, the new Palmer House displayed extravagant luxury and innovative features. The lobby ceiling frescoes were a series of 21 allegorical paintings by French artist Louis Pierre, Pierre Rigal, inspired by Bertha's love of the Sistine Chapel. <coughs> Excuse me. In 1996, acclaimed art restorer Lido Lippi, who was one of the lead restorers of the Sistine Chapel paintings, restored those at the Palmer House. Women had their own floor and each room had a bathtub. Retail stores lined the street level, including C.D. Peacock, a jeweler that began as House of Peacock in 1837 and was the first registered business in Chicago. When the retailer moved into its new Palmer House location, customers entered through bronze hand-forged doors decorated with peacocks. Designed by Lewis Comfort Tiffany, they weighed more than a ton. Three restaurants served guests, including the extravagant Empire Dining Room. In 1933, the Empire Room was converted into the hottest supper club in town. For more than 40 years, diners heard artists who would become legends, including Ella Fitzgerald, Harry Belafonte, Frank Sinatra, and Louis Armstrong. Unlike many of its competitors, the Palmer House survived the Depression, but it was soon to leave the Palmer family. 
enterprising hotelier Conrad Hilton came to Chicago to buy the Stevens in 1945. When its owner, Stephen A. Healy, kept changing the selling price, Hilton's broker threatened that they just buy the Palmer House instead. In the end, Conrad ended up with both. I see there are some questions coming in. And so this is the current lobby of the Palmer House, although right now it's, it's closed. It's been closed since March. Uh, and uh, I haven't, I have to see what the status is on it now. Oh, how did Henry Clark die? He died of cholera. Um, so that was part of, there was a cholera epidemic in 18, um, was it 38, I believe? And that, that's, he died of cholera. Oh, thank you, Grace. Uh, by the way, your book has a nice conversational tone. Good. That's what I'm going for. Cool. Um, I noticed I've got one more excerpt that I want to read. I've noticed it's already 743. Um, so let me know. Do you want me to keep going? Because I'm happy to read it. It's about the same length as the other. So it's going to be another 15, 20 minutes. So it's up to you guys, whatever you want me to do. Um, gosh, I, you know, it's flying by. If you have, if you have the energy and the and the uh, wherewithal to, to keep reading. I mean, I think we'd love to hear it. I, I personally would, and we've got, we're lucky enough to have you. So um, yeah, if you want to keep going and, and read those full, the full excerpts, please, we would love that. <laughs> okay, good. Cause I really love this next one because it's a story of a, one of Chicago's philanthropists and uh, you know, wealthy millionaires that really changed the sculpture of the city, but you don't hear about him. You don't hear about him like Ward or Marshall Field. And so I just, I love this next one. So I'll go, I'll keep going. Yay, exciting. Thanks everyone. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, got all the beverages here. All right, so auditorium building. I love this story. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Buildings like the auditorium don't just spring out of nowhere, especially in a marshy place with sewage problems. Somebody thinks, you know what we need? We need this, and then figures out how to make it happen. Ferdinand W. Peck was one of those somebodies. His name doesn't quickly roll off the tongue of Chicago history like Burnham or Palmer or Field, but it should. When his dream of a grand opera theater opened in 1889, he was the fourth richest man in the city. But more than wealth, he made significant cultural and societal contributions whose impact is still felt. Ferdinand's dad was a Chicagoan before there was a Chicago. His father, Philip Ferdinand Wheeler Peck, arrived in 1831 from New York aboard a schooner named Telegraph. The captain of the ship was none other than John Naper, the same John Naper that would move west and start his own settlement, which we now know as Naperville. Philip F. W. Peck came prepared for the rugged frontier with supplies, set up shop near Fort Dearborn, and quickly established himself as a successful, successful merchant. He built the first two-story frame structure in the village and took advantage of those early I&M canal lot sales. One of the few to financially survive the panic of 1837, he accumulated real estate until it was said that he was as rich as John Jacob Astor. In 1835, Philip married Mary Kay wife from Philadelphia. Of their eight children, only three survived. Ferdinand was the youngest, born on July 15, 1848, in the Peck home on Jackson Boulevard. By the time the young man passed the bar at the age of 21, the family had moved to Michigan Avenue, which meant their home was in the path of the fire. In a cruel twist of fate, P.F.W. Peck, who had been the second assistant engineer of Chicago's first fire department, died from injuries sustained during the blaze. Sidebar, it's more than likely that Philip F.W. Peck knew Henry B. Clark, builder of Chicago's oldest house. Not only did they serve together in Chicago's first fire department, but, but Clark also directed the one and only bank in the young town. As Philip was a mover and a shaker himself, he would have had to conduct any financial arrangements at Henry's bank. Heard, as he was generally known, built on the estate his father had left him, but he did more than just accumulate money. If his legacy is any indication, Ferd had a heightened sense of empathy and devoted much of his energies to philanthropy. He believed in taking care of animals and children and that everyone deserved musical, beautiful music, theater, and dance. He was an officer of the Illinois Humane Society. 
Founded in 1869 as the Illinois Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, in 1877, it officially changed its name because of the number of children it protected. He served on Chicago's Board of Education, and he brought opera to everyone. Did everyone even want opera? After all, opera goers could afford things like carriages and silk gowns and were the kind of people whose choice of attire for a performance appeared in the next day's newspaper. What would the working man or the shop girl care of Verdi or Wagner? Turns out, quite a lot. Burt's proof that his dream of bringing opera to the people would fulfill an actual demand was the Grand Opera Fest of 1885. He hired the young firm of Adler and Sullivan to build a theater within the quasi-temporary Interstate Industrial Exposition Building. It was a magnificent, magnificent success, not only because Denkmar Adler had illustrated his acoustic prowess, but also because the place was packed. Thousands filled the auditorium every night with more waiting to enter. Ferd knew that the city and its people, the real working people, and not just his neighbors on Michigan and Prairie Avenues, wanted and needed beautiful, expressive, and theatrical opera. He began planning. Then, on May 4th, 1886, a literal and figurative bomb exploded on the west side. The day before, police had killed strikers protesting for an eight-hour workday at McCormick Reaper Works. Laborers rallied. And when the mayor showed up, he ordered the police to disperse once he noticed the demonstration was peaceful. They didn't. As the last speaker, August Spees, took the stage, 200 police swarmed Haymarket Square. A bomb, lobbed by someone unknown, landed in the middle of the police officers. The bomb killed one, but seven more policemen and several protesters died in the ensuing violence. Despite the mystery of who actually threw the bomb and the supposition that most of the police officers died from friendly fire, eight men labeled as anarchists were prosecuted. Four were hung, one committed suicide, and it wasn't until 1894 that Governor John Altgeld pardoned the remaining three. The injustice of the whole affair kicked Ferd into gear. He was going to build the most magnificent and perfect theater and it would be open to everybody, not just the elite. Ferd used his considerable influence and his most Chicago of pedigrees to secure financing for the grandest grand theater that any city had ever seen. He presented the idea to the commercial club. To assuage concerns that the city couldn't sustain the size of theater he wanted, Ferd told them, hey, no worries. We're going to include an office building and a hotel. This thing will pay for itself. The pitch worked. Investors included Marshall Field who'd funded the armory for the Chicago police and refused to grant clemency to the alleged anarchists, and George Pullman, who would later lay off thousands of workers but wouldn't reduce their rents. On December 8th, seven months after the Haymarket riot, Ferdinand Peck incorporated the Chicago Auditorium Association. Ferd hired Adler and Sullivan again. They were a perfect pair. Dagmar Adler would handle the engineering and acoustics, and Louis Sullivan would make it all look good. The new Marshall Field Wholesale Store inspired their design, which would be ironic except for the fact that the warehouse had been designed by H.H. H. Richardson, an architect who greatly influenced the up-and-coming Sullivan. Dagmar and Lewis drafted an immense 10-story building with a 16-story tower constructed of brick and clad in terracotta with ornate embellishments. After some criticism from other prominent architects, namely Daniel Burnham's partner John Wellborn Root, the lighter material was traded in for load-bearing granite, heavy load-bearing granite. Excavation began January 28, 1887. This building would end up weighing 110,000 tons, and here they were digging into soft blue clay. They'd have to dig down more than 100 feet to get to solid bedrock. Denkmar worked with fellow engineer Paul Mueller to design a raft, an innovation invented by Root. The engineers crossed railroad ties, topped them with steel beams, and coated the whole thing in pitch, which made it watertight. Ta-da! A floating raft foundation that would sustain the weight of the building and wouldn't rot away even though it was below the water level. Sidebar. For the most part, the floating raft foundation worked. The building's still there, but if you enter the theater lobby, you'll notice there's a tilt to it. That's because after construction began, Ferd decided to add another two stories to the tower, which caused the floor to sink up to three feet. Construction began on June 1st, 1887, and President Grover Cleveland laid the cornerstone a few months later. Dagmar and Lewis were cutting it close. 
they would promised the building would be ready for the Republican National Convention the next summer. In February of 1888, they hired a young draftsman named Frank Lloyd Wright. They scrambled to complete this new auditorium building, but they were doing things that had never been done before. It would be the largest theater and the largest building in the world, with the tallest elevator shaft, a hydraulic stage with equipment seven feet below the water level, and air conditioning. The theater would be the first one lit entirely be by incandescent bulbs. Drop-down ceiling panels would allow companies to curtain the top balconies for more intimate performances. There were 4,200 seats and only 200 of them box seats, and those were set to the sides as an afterthought. Most impressive of all, Dankmar, without the aid of scientific calculations, designed a theater with perfect acoustics. The bullhorn shape, itself an innovation, transmitted a whisper from the stage to the furthest point in the highest balcony. There were literally no bad seats, which is exactly the democratic environment Peck had envisioned. That all came with the cost of both time and money. When June of 1888 rolled around, the Republicans dominated Benjamin Harrison in a building that was only five stories tall. By the time President Harrison returned on December 9, 1889, the final tally was more than $3,200,000. But oh, what a theater it was. Decorated by Lewis and his young protege, Frank Lloyd Wright, in gold leaf, metal, terracotta, onyx, and stencils, with life-sized murals and 55 million pieces of marble tile, and lit by 3,500 Edison bulbs, it was transcendent. As the president said on opening night, it is my wish, and may it be the wish of all, that this great building may continue to be to all your population that which it should be, an edifice opening its doors from night to night, calling your people here away from the care of business to those enjoyments, pursuits, and entertainments which develop the souls of men, which will have power to inspire those whose lives are heavy with daily toil, and in its magnificent and enchanting presence, lift them for a time out of those dull things into those higher things where men should live. Dankmar and Lewis moved into offices on the top floor of the tower. The tower became an observation deck with a 32-foot bi-level turret. The theater was loved by everyone, including the people who inspired Ferd in the first place. He sponsored working men's concerts, subsidizing tickets so those who normally wouldn't be able to afford this luxury could attend. The only Bah humbug seemed to be Theodore Thomas, founder of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra in 1891. According to Chicago's Left Bank by Alson J. Smith, Theodore was not a fan. The stage was deep, the acoustics perfect, but to Thomas it was a cavern. The necessary rapport between orchestra and audience could not be established. Moreover, since there were always empty seats, it was difficult to sell season tickets. It cost so much to heat and light that it light it that rehearsals had to be held in other smaller halls. In 1893, the World's Columbian Exposition put Chicago center stage and Ferd showcased his grand opera house to the world. It received universal acclaim. The building also brought recognition to the firm of Adler and Sullivan, as it should. But despite its innovation and beauty and perfection, the auditorium building suffered. The projected subsidizing of the theater by the offices and hotel never materialized. The offices were too close to the tracks on Wabash and hotel guests thought one bathroom for every 10 rooms was woefully inadequate. With the exception of Thomas, who'd taken his orchestra up the street to the new symphony hall in 1904, performers still loved it. From 1910 to 1929, the Chicago Opera Association which would become the Chicago Civic Opera Company, invited tenors and sopranos and altos and baritones to test those pristine, precise acoustics. But when the opera got its own building too, the end for the auditorium was in sight. In 1930 and 31, there were even talks of demolition. Talks, they were taking bids, but tearing it down would be too expensive. And the century of progress served as the auditorium's saving grace during the Great Depression. That was a temporary fix. During World War II, the city of Chicago took over the building and turned it into an officer's center. The stage became a bowling alley. Dankmar's perfectly designed acoustical showcase gave new meaning to the sound of pins dropping. Much later, in its nomination for the National Register of Historic Places, the auditorium building would be described as the most important structure of its time in Chicago and probably in the United States. But in 1946, this treasure was on its last legs. Roosevelt University stepped in and bought it, 
moving their operations into the former offices and hotel. While they couldn't afford to return the theater to its former glory, they held on until, onto it until someone could. A renovation of magnitude required by Auditorium Theater would require several someones, and Roosevelt University trustee Beatrice Spackner found them. She rounded up like-minded people and created the Auditorium Theater Council in 1960. Seven years later, the theater reopened with New York City Ballet's performance of George Balanchine's A Midsummer Night's Dream. Over the next several years, the Grand Theater hosted music legends Aretha Franklin, Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, Pink Floyd, Miles Davis, The Who, and Nina Simone. The Grateful Dead performed at the auditorium 10 times between 1971 and 1977. The building joined the National Register of Historic Places, then became a National Historic Landmark, and then a Chicago Landmark. Since that first performance at the reopening, dance troops, including Alvin Ailey and the Bolshoi Ballet, have pas de deux their way across the legendary stage. In 1998, the Joffrey Ballet began its residency. In 2020, that residency ended. That's it, and that is the exterior of the auditorium building. Oh, this is a Richardsonian Romanesque architecture, and you can see the tower up there that um, when Adler and Sullivan were in the building, they had uh, observatory. You could, it was the first observatory in the city, really. And I did see there were some questions. So let me see. Nope, no, there weren't any more questions. Okay, just wanted to make sure. Okay, so uh, are there any questions about the readings I've done so far? I figured um, this slide now, I'm going on to the, a uh, lot of the resources I've used. I figure since you are library patrons that you are interested in where all this information uh, came from. Oh, okay. yeah, there you go. I was curious, um, do you know any stories about how they got to the light bulbs? How did they change the light bulbs? Do you know? <laughs> I don't wondering. know. I have to look that up. I'll have to, I'll have to do some research on that. Um, I don't know. They might have, and, hmm. I, I'm wondering if they came down through the ceiling. I'm curious too, because okay. there there's no ladder there's no ladder to no. <laughs> as far as I know. I'm no ladder expert, but I'm curious. Oh, no, yo, I'll have to that's I love that. I'll have to I'll have to find that out. <laughs> we have a question from Ava. Um, she put it in the chat. She asks, what is in the auditorium building now? Uh, Roosevelt University has their offices there and there are classrooms as well, but there's also the auditorium theater. It's still, well, it's been shut down this year, um, but they, it's still there. And up until this year, the Joffrey Ballet had performed, but the hotel rooms were turned into the university's offices and classrooms. So if you're a student at Roosevelt University, you're taking classes in this building, which is just cool. amazing. That's so cool. So, and they my do- favorite. Yeah, I, I just I love how you how a lot of a lot of these landmarks have been repurposed, uh, but there's still so much of it is preserved so that you can still experience that history. They do tours at uh, well, they've got virtual tours. Uh, they have been doing some in person tours. I don't know. I, they're everybody's going to have to go back and stuff now, but um, they do have a lot of virtual tours. Awesome. Okay, so a lot of the resources that I use, the Library of Congress is a fantastic resource. I use that a lot for um, images um, because they have a lot of the primary domain, but the Chronicling America is part of a Library of Cong Congress and they have newspaper articles dating back to the 1600s. Now in Chicago, they only go back to the early 1800s because that's when Chicago started. Um, and the first paper didn't start till like 1838, I think it was in Chicago, but um, they don't have like the Chicago Tribune um, is only a few years. Fortunately, the years that they have on the Chronicling America are the years in like the Palmer House. So that's how I did the research and I dug back into Let's see, when did it open and when were they actually married? So you can go into Chronicling America, Chronicling America. you can search by state, you can search by actual um, publication, 
and dates and search for various keyword phrases. So it's a really powerful um, and rabbit hole of a, a resource. <laughs> wow. So it's, it's really cool. Um, Encyclopedia of Chicago. This was published, I uh, believe it was early 2000s, but it was by um, Chicago History Museum, uh, previously the Chicago Historical Society. Uh, they published this Encyclopedia of Chicago, and it's a it's an encyclopedia, so you, it's a good starting place. Um, and so they've got it online. It's kind of difficult to uh, search; their search function isn't great, but the information is all there. Uh, so, but they, if you can get it from your library, which you got, you probably have a copy. I would. I, I would. You know what? I'll check while while we while we chat. Let's see. We do. We do. There's okay. Pat. Pat knows. Yeah, it's, Pat knows everything. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, and it's 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 one of those you just want to browse it. Like I don't know if you're you know probably like me since you work in the library that you could spend all day browsing an unabridged dictionary mm -hmm. and I'm the same way with the encyclopedias. And this is also the same. And in the center, there's, they've got this timeline, which is just fascinating because you can see the timeline in the various architecture and culture and government um, social. So you can kind of see how everything all plays together. So it's, if you won't really want to lose a, a month of your you know, <laughs> life digging into this history, you can, you can do that. <laughs> cool. Um, newspapers.com is also great. We were talking earlier that that's a resource you can access through um, the online portal at Crystal Lake Public Library. Uh, this one, the uh, same thing with Chicago Tribune and some of the larger publications, you have to actually pay to, you have to subscribe to access some of them, but they also have um, uh, newspapers from around the world and you can get, as a library patron, you can access them as well, right? Yes. Um, and if you're doing it from home, you just need your library card. So check your local library too, if you're not from Crystal Lake or Algonquin, because a lot of libraries subscribe to newspapers.com for their patrons. Yeah. Um, I think my favorite, favorite, favorite resource, besides the library, of course, is um, <laughs> halfatrust.org. Are you, have you, are you familiar with that, Katie or Pat? I'm not. I am. I, I, I teach at Harper and, and yes, we use it quite a bit. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? Uh, Are you, oh, yeah. It wonderful. is. If you want to see original sources um, that it, you can, and you can get a free account. Uh, you can get a guest account. They, if, um, so I just sign in with my Google ID and I can research and you can create collections. And so I found um, the, uh, reports from the Chicago Historical Society in the, uh, you know, mid 1800s. And uh, it's, it's just, it's phenomenal. I, I should have made a list of some of the, some examples of the things I've been able to find. Uh, Lewis Sullivan's tracks. I found the Interocean or um, Interocean, which was a magazine and newspaper back um, in the 1800s that had a lot of information about um, the different architecture and the stories. And that's how I, Using half the trust, I was able to find out that the Blackstone had a bathroom for every hotel room, and that's something that they, the Blackstone didn't, um, you know, when I, I talked to them and did a tour, that they weren't aware of. So I was like, oh, look what I found, and sent it. But it's, it's just this incredible resource, and they've got, it's not just architecture. It's any, all these original documents, um, like they've got tons and tons and tons of sheet music. So, Ooh. yeah, so I shared that with, with Jim, my husband, who is a musician, um, and he owns the Carolyn Connection and with a voice like this, and he, uh, it, they've got all this public domain, and most of it is, pu all, uh, Pat, is all of it public domain or just most um, of it? it? Yeah, generally, if you want to get the full, um, full thing, it's public domain. There are a lot of things there where you can get some of the annotations of things, but they haven't, if they're too new, I think 1924 um, yeah. and, and up, you can't quite get the whole thing at this point, but then in another year you can get 1924 and then 1925 and so on. Very cool though. I'm so glad Pat's on here with us. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great resource at our library. <laughs> 
Oh, Teresa, I think we lost. Can you still hear me? Oh, no. Teresa, can you hear her? I cannot hear Teresa right now. No. Oh, no. One moment, everybody. Thanks for your patience. Technology. Is that better? Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay. Mm -hmm. I just, it was my new fancy lavalier mic stopped working. Oh, no. Of course. I, of course. I, I, <laughs> It lasted for an hour, so that's okay. Good. Good job, Lavalier. You did your best. Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. There we go. Let's see. We'll just go back. Um, I wasn't quite on that yet. There we go. I was answering a question, or was I? Oh, I was saying. So, yeah, because you can create different collections. So, like, when, during the research for this book, I had a collection for Chicago Architects, and I had another collection for, you can download uh, the whole book in some cases, uh, which makes it easier. You can just download the PDF version. So then I could upload it to my, my Google Drive or my tablet, and that way I can read it at my leisure and don't have to be on the browser. So that, that's, that's been very helpful. Um, and because they're public domain, I'm going to be able to put a lot of those resources on the Living Landmarks website so that they're much, so that they're easy to search and I can directly link to the landmarks. You can see where that original, where that research came from, where, where, how did I find that information? Because there's so much packed in here. Um, and I didn't want to do footnotes because it's, it's, there's so much to be, and I've, can find them can be pretty distracting. So that's why I wanted to use the, the website is more of my bibliography. Yeah, that's so cool. So um, Chicago, 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 Chicagoology, he even says how to pronounce it. And I don't know the person who runs this, but he um, also has a lot of um, Chicago research on original research on there. So you can usually just search for any a landmark that you're interested in and it'll bring up uh, a lot of the articles, but it's a good res resource. It's a good starting place too. Um, it doesn't, he doesn't really interpret a lot of the information, but he puts so much out there and it, yeah, I'm very impressed with his researching skills. <laughs> um, and then I also just doing on the ground tours and interviews like, so many like you can tour the clark house when they reopen they do free tours uh the glessner house does free tours on wednesdays you can tour the um, whole house museum um with you know which is where with jane adams you could do tours of there as well uh charlie persky house um so they're they're it's they a lot of them are free or they have free days when they return and then, of course, your library. That's the best resource. <laughs> awesome. Um, oh, can't wait till we can go back and do tours. And I know. And tourists again. <laughs> oh. uh, so Living Landmarks will be out in December. And uh, you can pre-order a copy if you'd like. Uh, it's uh, Go to tlt.rocks, R-O-C-K-S. Uh, slash L L O C that'll take you to the pre-order page and play a little more. Uh, and if you use code C L P L at checkout, then you'll save $5. Oh, awesome. Oh. That's so great. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, what is in the auditorium? Okay. I just, Oh, thank you for putting that in there, Katie. Absolutely. Um, and I still make sure I haven't missed it. Anymore. Oh, thank you. Ah, hi, Vera. Yay. She's saying, looking forward to seeing you at the San Diego Travel Show, America's oh. Finest City, December 9th. Oh. Yes. You are welcome, Mary. Very exciting. Thank you. Yeah. That's my other love, Chicago and road trips. <laughs> so I know, you're becoming, our, you're becoming our area expert. Very cool. Very cool. Nice. 
So, all right. Any other Great. questions or? Let's see, just some, just some lovely comments. Mary, I enjoyed the presentation. Thanks mm -hmm. very much. And Deb, great presentation. Vera is from San Diego. She lives in San Diego. Yay. Thanks for coming, Vera. Yeah. I, Vera, are you, we met at the travel show, right? I believe we met at the, because I've uh, spoken at and have present, had a, exhibited at the San Diego Travel Adventure Show. So. She says yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and thank you for the love. She's also emailed me. So thank you for the lovely emails. So oh. Yeah, that was probably the same, Vera. Oh. That's so cool. We had a little uh, um, addition from Ava in the chat. She had asked what is in the auditorium building now. Um, she added that, she says, my daughter did take classes at CCPA. So that explains why the building was so old. <laughs> no. <laughs> yes, <it does. laughs> Uh, it's crazy. That was supposed to actually be office building and hotel rooms, but the the um, the rooms that are on the the side of the, the east side facing Grant Park, those were the hotel rooms, uh, but they didn't quite work out. People wanted bathrooms even then. <laughs> oh my gosh! Ten, I like when you said ten rooms per one bathroom. <laughs> I was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> I mean, I know, I know that was more common than to like share a common bathroom, but whoa. Well, it surprised me because in the late 18, 1889, it was becoming more common to have more bathrooms. Um, I know in like with Palmer House, you could have, I think they had what, Palmer House number three or four, I think it was the one that's <laughs> there now. It's um, they had bathrooms many more than they Definitely more than 10 per room. <laughs> yeah. Or 10 rooms per bathroom. I know they wanted to pay for that auditorium theater there. They, yep. they, they cheaped out on their bathrooms. <laughs> yeah, so this is the fun thing about this book that I really enjoy is all the connections. Just learning. I mean, like knowing that Ferdinand Perk's father had to know Henry Clark because there weren't that many people there and they were both, you know, they both, both volunteered at the fire department um, so, and then well, there was only one bank in town, so you know they had to interact. And then learning like Jane Addams and Bertha Honore, although they were ran in different circles, they also ran in the same circles. Oh, it's, you know, seeing these connections, it's just really cool. Well, it makes them feel like real people, like it mm -hmm. brings them alive. They're not just kind of, you know, like you said earlier, they're not just static you know, little, almost like statues from history where you just don't right. imagine them actually living a life, a full mm -hmm. life. And so I look, your stories really bring that all to life. And I, I could just listen to you all night. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so thank you so much. Oh, it's been my there pleasure. Might be a, there might be a couple more in the q and I'll let you take a look there. Okay. Oops, Hotel Del Oh, love Hotel Del, Del Coronado. It's so beautiful. Yeah, I think they're all oh, answered. Yay. Awesome. Yeah. And speaking of Jane Addams, a funny little interesting anecdote about her. Uh, she had a, a friend and partner, and we think that she was – I mean, she was definitely more than just just a friend because she, when she traveled, when Jane traveled traveled to Europe, without her friend, um, she took a picture with her. But she didn't just take a picture; she took a a painting, a portrait that was like this huge that you put over a mantelpiece. In fact, if you tour the house now, it's over the the um, hanging on the wall in Jane Addams' bedroom, um, oh my and it's this. Huge. She'd have it shipped with her. I just thought <laughs> wow. that was awesome. <laughs> That's a, you almost want, you got to wonder like how much did it cost to bring the painting versus just bringing her friend, her, her friend. Her right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the old, she lives with her friend. Yes. Uh, yep. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, uh, you got it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Love it. That's awesome. Oh, you're, you're full of such great stories. Thank you so much for Thank sharing you. your time with us tonight and all of your hard work. You've been working on this book now 
for a good chunk of this year, it was intended we were going to have Teresa come visit us. Um, oh, gosh, you know, earlier this year, I think we had it set up for April, I think, or was it June? I don't know. <sighs> Somewhere in there. We kept moving it yeah. because we were trying to figure out when we were going to reopen for, for regular mm -hmm. activities. And then we realized, let's just do it this way because now it's been 10,000 years since the beginning of this year. And we're, you know, Zoom is, Zoom is the thing. So we're going <laughs> to, we yeah. hopefully will have you back <laughs> sometime soon on whatever topic you want because we just love you. So. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody, for coming, and thank you, Teresa, and uh, sure. yeah, uh, I hope everybody has a wonderful rest of their evening, and we will get you that YouTube link once we have it. Great. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Bye.